right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to say happy Father's Day to those that are fathers out there. Um, I know some of you are out there watching. Some of you are logged in. And um, as a father, I don't know if... Oh, I'm sure you felt this. You felt the burden, the stress of um, taking care of the family, providing for the family, and being tasked with leading the family. And, and it's, it's, it's a lot to carry. Uh, but I think we find, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We, we find relief from that burden in knowing that this is our Father's world, that our Heavenly Father is in control of everything. And so when we feel like it's a bit much, if we ever feel like, you know, there's just too much to take care of, we know that we can come to our Heavenly Father and, and we should always come to our Heavenly Father and acknowledge that He is in control. So it's good to know that. But happy Father's Day. Um, for the purpose, for the purposes of this morning's sermon, um, as you know, we have been going through the letters from Paul and we are currently looking at his, uh, the first letter that we have that he wrote to the church in Corinth. But for the purposes of today's sermon, we're going to be looking at uh, a few different passages from the Bible, looking at a few uh, illustrations that God has given us. And so let's begin this morning. Begin this morning, if you will. Um, have your Bibles ready. We're going to be flipping a lot, a lot. Turn with me to the book of Genesis. Turn with me to the book of Genesis. We're going to start at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and when you are there, um, if you want to read along out loud or to yourself, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Right in the very beginning, right in the very beginning as a part of his creation, God gave us this, this special bond, this special relationship between man and woman, between husband and wife, this relationship that we now know and call marriage. And, and at the very rudimentary level, um, and it was intended by God for this purpose, mar <clears throat> marriage was given to mankind because, you know, I, I quote God himself, he said, it is not good. It is not good for man to be alone. That's why he said, I'm going to give Adam a helper. And he, he said, man needs a helper. And, and you know, we, I often posit this thought. When we say that man needed a helper and therefore a woman was created, the thought we always need to have is who is in the more powerful position? The one who is helping or the one that needs help? Right? And, and so God created woman, woman was created, and marriage was given to us. Now, turn with me. I told you we're going to be uh, flipping here and there. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 30 to 32, Paul writes this to us. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This, verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. I speak concerning Christ and the church. In, in this uh, part of the Bible, Paul has been writing to the church in Ephesus and he's been teaching on the relationship, proper relationship that God had ordained between husband and wife, how husband and wife ought to love each other, how they demonstrate that love to each other. And then, and then right there, he takes a left turn and he says, well, actually the relationship between husband and wife, this thing we call marriage is, is the relationship between Christ and the church. That's what I'm talking about. It's a relationship between Christ and the church. And God gave us this relationship of marriage between man and woman to help us to understand what this relationship between Christ and the church is. And Paul says, it's a great mystery. 
It's a great mystery. And for those of us who have been married, I think you'll agree with me that this relationship of marriage is a great mystery. And I don't, I'm not saying that in, in the sense of, oh, I've been married for 19 years and, you know, I, I still don't understand her kind of mystery. Not that kind of mystery, but a mystery of that there is just always more. There is always more in their relationship. You've been married for a year. You think, I know my wife so well. I know my husband so well. Guess what? You continue to learn more about each other. You continue to learn more about how to love each other, how to care for each other, how to give up of yourself for each other. And this is a mystery that for all our lives, for, for, for from the day you say, I do, until this day you say, Goodbye, I'm going to go see the Lord. That, that long journey, it's, it's an unraveling of this mystery. And we come to know more and more what it is that God intended for us in this institution of marriage and how he uh, shows us the relationship between Christ and the church. And this joining together, this joining together between husband and wife, in the same way, we, the church, we are joined with Christ. And, and Paul says we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And I've said this, and I'll say it again. This does not mean, the word member here does not mean that we are members as in members of an organization, but the word member here, it literally means limbs, a body part or a limb. We are limbs in the body of Christ. We are the limbs of the body of of Christ. We are extensions. We are extensions of the Lord Jesus. And this favorite phrase of mine, one of my favorite phrases, it's not scripture, but I think it encapsulates a big part of what scripture says in, in, in helping us to understand what it means when the Bible says that Jesus is the word became flesh. That this phrase that I love a lot, I heard from Brother Ernie years ago, and it's really stuck with me. We as members of of the body of Christ, we put the skin on Jesus. We put the skin on Jesus so that people who don't know Jesus can see and feel and touch Jesus through us. So in that sense, we are the extension of who Jesus Christ is. We are members of his body. Now, when you think about that idea, right, when, when you think about the idea that you put the skin on Jesus, so to speak, um, you should you should then think really hard about what you do because everything that you do, you are bringing Jesus with you. You are, you are an extension of Jesus. So whatever you do, wherever you go, you bring Jesus with you. And it's kind of, all of this that I've said so far is in a way kind of a long introduction that brings us then this morning back to the book of 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, as we begin this chapter, and you can turn there now as I'm speaking, as we begin this chapter, we see Paul admonishing some in the church. He says, look, what are you guys doing? Why are you, why are you suing each other? Why are you taking each other to trial, to court? And, and it's, it's not so much about members of the church taking each other to court, um, but it's, you're doing this in front of a non-believer. You are bringing these matters before a non-believer, a non-believing judge. And look, Paul's not so much making a point about having a bad testimony before the unbeliever. But I think, I think the emphasis that Paul is putting here <coughs> as, as he admonishes the church regarding taking each other to court, I think the emphasis will find in verses 7 to 8. So 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 7 to 8, Paul writes this. He writes, Now therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. He's, he's being pretty, pretty pointed and pretty harsh here. He says, It's already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat and you do these things to your brethren. You're, you're, you're taking a brother to trial for something that you do to him. So Paul says, you're being a hypocrite. You're being a hypocrite. You, you're taking someone to trial for the very same thing that you do to each other. 
And But more pointedly, Paul says this, can't you just take a loss? In, in uh, verse 7, he says, why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourself be cheated? Why must you, this is what Paul is saying, why must you be so consumed by the matter that you you have to overcome, you, you're, you're overcome. Why do you have to be so consumed by this matter that you are overcome by the need for justice? Why are you so consumed about the loss that you are going to go to court to right the wrong? It's a warning. It's a warning to, to the people in Corinth and to us today. It's a warning to us about being mastered by that loss that you've suffered, being mastered by the need to right a wrong. It's a warning against living by the flesh. It's a warning to remember this when, when Peter, when Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? What did Jesus say? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And again, you know, this is what we're talking about when we talk about living by the spirit versus living by the flesh. Living by the spirit will never lead you to what the world gives you as a natural response of what you should do, right? Of course you should go to court. Of course you should make things right. Justice needs to be served. Um, when we live by the spirit, we, we do not arrive at the same conclusion as the world would. Just as living by the flesh, you will never come to the same conclusion that you would if you were living by the spirit. It is only in living by the spirit that we can bring ourselves to say, you know what? You've wronged me once, twice, three times, seven times, 49 times, 70 times seven. 70 times seven. You know, we, when we teach this passage before, we used to say, oh, did Jesus mean 70 times seven? That's 490 times. Did he mean once per year? Because that's, that's once a day that someone wrongs you. Or did he mean once per month, once per week, once per day? Look, once per day sounds impossible because 400, to have someone wrong you 490 times, that means they have to be with you the whole time. So maybe it's your spouse. But it, it's even if we stretch it out to a year, to have someone wrong you more than once a day for a whole year and to still forgive them, to still turn the other cheek, to still say, no, don't worry, it's fine. That's not something that we can possibly do by the flesh. By the flesh, we can forgive someone once maybe. Twice, uh, three times, you know what, forget it. This friendship is over. This relationship is over. And so living by the Spirit is the only way that we can come to that point where we can, we can rather choose to accept wrong, that we can rather choose to let ourselves be cheated. And so Paul here, in addressing the, the Corinthians taking each other to court, he's illustrating this one aspect of failure to live by the Spirit. He says, he said right there, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. And then as he continues to write, he goes on to, to uh, other unrighteous attitudes and behaviors. And you can look at the list there yourself in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But here's the thing, Paul is not, he didn't make this list of wrongdoings and sinful behavior and attitudes. He didn't make the list to condemn anyone. Rather, he writes this list, and then in verse 11, look at what he says, beautiful words. Verse 11 of chapter 6, he says this, and such were some of you, right? As I'm writing this list of these terrible things, that people do and are, Paul says, and such were some of you. As I'm writing to you, the church, some of you were these very things that I'm listing here. These, these people who cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And again, I want to stress, God is not being punitive 
when he says, when you are these things, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What God is saying is, when you are these things, there is something else in your life that is a greater priority, that is a greater desire than the kingdom of God. If the kingdom of God was what you wanted, then you wouldn't be doing these things. But since these, the, this list of other things, if the other things is what you want, then God says, go ahead and have it. Inherit what you desire in your life, but then it's not going to be the kingdom of God. But Paul says, look, such were some of you. Though There were some of you in, I mean, look, last week we just looked at a, a, somebody who married his stepmother. And so there's stuff going on in the church in Corinth that is not healthy, to put it lightly. Right? But Paul writes these things not to condemn them, but to say, such were some of you. But, but you were washed. But you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Do you see that? Okay, this is English class time now. You know, I, I married an English teacher, and so it rubs off on me a little bit. Three times, three times, Paul says, this, this was you, but, this was you, but, this was you, but. Three times he says, put all that behind because you've been washed. You've been sanctified, and you've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Let me say that again. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So therefore, now, now believers, believers in Corinth, Believers in San Jose, believers in Sunnyvale, believers in Santa Clara, believers in Los Gatos, believers in, in who am I forgetting, Mountain View, believers down south in, in Southern California, Ontario, believers, you, some of you were those things, but now you are washed, now you are different, now you are no longer the old you. There is now a separation because of what Christ has done in washing us and sanctifying us and justifying us. There is a clear distinction, separation between you now and the old you, and there is a clear separation between you and the world. A clear separation between you and the world. Then Paul goes on to give us a, a, a really... Um, I don't want to say it's a graphic illustration, but it kind of is when you think about it, of why there needs to be that separation from the world. He, he shows us what happens spiritually when we join ourselves once again to the world that we have been called out of. First Corinthians chapter 6, go down to verse 16. Paul says, Or do you not know? And the way he writes it is it's almost like, yeah, some of you have done this in the past. And so you, you should understand what I'm talking about. Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot, to a prostitute, a woman of ill repute, do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. You are now members of the body of Jesus Christ. So when you join yourselves once again to the harlotry of the world, think about what you are doing as a body of Christ in becoming one with the world again. The sacrilege, the blasphemy of that. And so, so you are either, you are either with the Lord because you've been washed, you've been sanctified, and you've been justified. You are either with the Lord or you are with the world. You're either with the Lord or you're with the world. There is no middle ground. I don't know if I can make it more clear. The Lord or the world, there is no middle ground. You, you can't have one foot on each side and say, I'm, I'm going to enjoy the Lord's blessings and I'm going to enjoy the world's pleasures. There is no middle ground. And I, I don't know if I can be more clear. And so maybe, maybe let's, let's ask Jesus what he thinks. Let's ask Jesus what he thinks. Turn with me to the book of Joshua. 
book of Joshua, and, and this was before, before Joshua attacks the city of Jericho. Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15 tells us this. And it came to pass, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man, in my Bible, the man is capitalized. A man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us? or for our adversaries, because Joshua was getting ready to attack the city of Jericho. And so he, he comes in the middle of the night and, and comes across this, this man standing in the middle of the desert with a sword drawn. And he says, you on our side or are you on their side? Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he, the man, says this, no. And Joshua is thinking, I asked you an either or question, not a yes or no question, but the answer from this man is no. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandal off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Okay, so we're reading from the book of Joshua and some of you are thinking, hey, hold, hold on a second, Jason. I thought you said, let's ask Jesus what he thinks. Why are you reading from the Old Testament? Now, I want to say this. Many Bible scholars and theologians believe and agree that this man with a capital M in the desert was Jesus Christ. And, and, and I, I am in agreement with that. And, and what Jesus says to us here in this encounter with Joshua is there are no sides to pick except the Lord's side and everything else. And here is Joshua. Joshua has taken over command of the people of Israel after Moses passed, and he's leading God's people. He's doing God's good work. And you would think for someone in Joshua's position, I am leading the 2.7 million people that have survived this journey through the wilderness. I am leading God's people. In a sense, he's a spiritual leader. He's, he's a mentor. He's a, a shepherd, a pastor, whatever you want to call him. And it should and would be very easy for Joshua to think, well, of course God is on my side because I am doing his work. But even with Joshua, when we come to sides, Jesus says, no, there are no sides except I come as a commander of the host of the Lord's army. And then there's everything else. There's God, and then there's everything else. And so the, the question or, or, or the, the thought that's posed before us this morning is, whose side are you on? It's not us coming to God and saying, you on my side or are you on their side? But it's we have to ask ourselves, am I on God's side or am I on the world's side? And our proper response, our proper response, look, this is the way our response oftentimes is. When it comes to a matter of contention, our response always is, Jesus, I'm praying now, you know, and, and we pray eloquent prayers and, and we demonstrate to Jesus what the situation is. And then we quote Bible verses in our prayers as, as if to say, God, you, you need to see the situation. Let, let me give you bullet points of why you need to be on my side and help me vanquish my enemies. That's not the proper response. Our proper response when we, come before to, when we come before Jesus is to fall on our face to worship him. We fall on our face to worship him because we realize who he is. He is the commander of the host of the Lord's army. Remember Peter. Remember Peter when they went out to fish. And Jesus said, throw your net on this side. And then some of the responses were, hey, man, come on. We're seasoned pros at this. We've been fishing all night and we've caught nothing. And you, a carpenter, is now going to come tell us how to fish? But, okay, fine. Just to prove you wrong, we're going to do it. They throw their nets over. And there was so much fish, they almost couldn't bring the nets in. And everybody else was marveling, marveling. Oh, wow, we're going to have fish for dinner tonight. Except for Peter. And he fell on his face before Jesus and said, get away from me. 
Get away from me. I can't be in your presence because I've seen now who you are. And this is our response when we come before Jesus, when we see who he is and we see who we are before him. Our response should never be, get on my side, Jesus. Our response should always be, on my knees, on my face. Lord, I can't even come before you. Who are you? Who am I that you would love me? What, and, and that's our proper response to the Lord. And, and you, you, might, you might be looking at this passage from Joshua, and you might say, well, okay, that's, that's just Old Testament rhetoric. Because, you know, the God of the Old Testament was all fire and brimstone. But the New Testament is all about love and grace and mercy. Okay, so let's continue. Let's ask Jesus again what he thinks. Turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verses 17 and 19 says this. This is Jesus in, in his last conversation with the disciples. And look, when you come to the, the, these three chapters, verses 14 to 16 of John, when you come to these verses, these chapters, these words from Jesus, understand when someone is giving their last words, there, there's, it's all, not that everything else Jesus said was not significant, but some, a person's last words, it always carries weight. It's always going to be, this is what I want to leave you with. And one of the things that Jesus says, chapter 15, he says this in verse 17. These things I command you that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I, Jesus says, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Because I chose you out of the world, and I have made you mine, you are now on my side, and the world will hate you. Turn just two more chapters ahead. Uh, chapter 17, verses 15 to 16. In chapter 17, the Lord is praying for his disciples, not just the ones that were physically next to him at that moment, but all those who would come to be his disciples by the hearing of the word. Jesus prays for us, and he prays this. I do not pray that you, God the Father, should take them, that's us, out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So, a very clear delineation, a very clear boundary. There's me and mine, says Jesus, and everything else. Just like what he said to Joshua, I come on the Lord's side. You can come and be on my side, or you can be on the everything else side. I don't choose sides. I am the side, God says. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. We need to bring the love and compassion and gentleness and grace and mercy and everything else that Jesus is. We need to bring that to the world to bring them to salvation. And we are in the world. We live in the world. Jesus says, I didn't pray, Father, that you would take them out of the world. They're, they're so in the world. But I've called them out. They are now separated. So we live in the world, but separated. And we have a duty. We have a calling to put the skin on Jesus. But having said that, having said that, our relationship with the world can only go so far. Our relationship with the world, with the world that is unbelieving, can only go so far. Because at the end of the day, and I'm sorry to say this, and I've seen this happen often enough. At the end of the day, when we express our faith, when we proclaim the sovereignty and supremacy and excellency of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, the world can only have one of two reactions. When we shine Jesus out, the world can only have one of two reactions. One is as a light of the Lord shines on them that they see what is in their heart and they recognize their sin and they are led to repentance and then to salvation. 
and then they are on God's side. Or the other reaction is covering their ears and yelling and gnashing their teeth, just like we saw with the people as they reacted to Stephen the martyr. Only one or two reactions, either coming to repentance, seeking forgiveness and salvation, or, or like Jesus said, hatred. That's the only one, one of the only two relationships that we can have with the world. Either they come to the Lord or there is that relationship of animosity. And, and it may not be outright explicit hatred and animosity. But we have different masters. We can't get along. We have different goals. We have different ways of seeing things. We have different lives. We have the life of Jesus in us. And, and so when we think of the world... Jesus says this, I chose you. I chose you out of the world. Therefore, and this is hard to hear, but we need to understand and accept this. Therefore, the world hates you. The world hates you. I'll give you a a, a good example. You know, when it comes... And this, this is relevant to what is happening today. When it comes to this very real issue of racism, when we talk about racism as Christians, as children of God, as believers of Jesus Christ, as, as people who, who take the word of God and understand that this is life itself and this is God himself, We understand from the word of God that racism is wrong because it violates the word of God. And so somebody maybe is now turning to their index in the back. Oh, let's see. Does the word racism appear in in the Bible? Let, Let me tell you what God says about racism. Going back to Genesis, you don't have to turn there. But Genesis chapter one, God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Well, what is God's stance on racism? When you look down on someone for whatever reason, and racism is where you look down on someone as lesser because of their race, you are violating the the, 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 the dignity and sovereignty of a person who was created in the image of God. Jesus loves each and every human being because each and every human being, regardless of of their color, regardless of, of how they look, they were created in the image of God. And so God says, you better not treat anyone different. They were all created in my image. This is all reflections of me. When we seek, look, we, we should seek the Lord's will when it comes to racism in that we should seek to eradicate it because it is not right in the eyes of the Lord. But when we don't seek to follow God's will, This is where things go wrong in the world. When we do not seek to follow God's will, we will always find a reason to look down on one another. Today, it may be racism. Tomorrow, it may be classism. Another day, it may be sexism. There's always, always, if we don't seek to follow God's will and recognize imago dei, made in the image of God, if we don't recognize the the awesomeness and sovereignty of that, there will always be another ism that comes into our hearts, that comes into society, that comes into this fallen world. Without respecting each living person as created in the image of God, we're only going to be able to see what our eyes filter and and what our hearts distort. I'm going to borrow from from an uh, excellent sermon that I listened to this week. The disciples of Jesus Christ himself. The disciples of Jesus Christ himself. I don't know if you remember this account, but they they, they had heard about someone who was casting out demons in the name of Jesus. And the disciples came to Jesus and they said, we saw someone who does not follow us 
casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. Do you see what is that? Even the disciples who were walking in close proximity with Jesus, you would think that who Jesus was is rubbing off on them. Even the disciples of Jesus found some reason to have that separation of he is different from us. He is not us. He is an other in this case because he didn't follow us because he's not part of our entourage. And so therefore, stop it. Stop casting out demons in the name of Jesus because you're not with us. You're not cool. You, you don't get to use the name of Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus rebuked them, the disciples. Our fallen nature, our fallen nature will always, always, because we are smart. People are smart. We find a way. Our fallen nature will always find a way to make someone one of the others and to treat them differently. When, and it's only when we deal with the sin in our hearts, that's when we can start to heal this nastiness that is in us that wants to separate and separate and separate and put down and put down and put down. It's only when we deal with the sin in our hearts, when we get on our knees and we pray and touch God's heart, that's when our heart breaks, and that's when we, our heart breaks for our own brokenness when we see what vile creatures we are, and then our hearts break not only for our own brokenness, but also for the atrocities being suffered by people because their skin is a different color. Only, only then can, we, can our hearts truly be broken. Only when we overcome the sin of selfishness and be able to truly love our neighbors as ourselves. Only then would you be able to love a person. A person, I'm talking about a person, not just a category of people, but to love a person regardless of what their skin is. And, and we love a person and our heart breaks for that person when he describes being afraid to go out and run errands at night because of his skin color. Then we truly have a heart that is broken for the plight of a person and of a group of people. Only when we deal with that sin. Only when we deal with that sin. And, and look, we were, we were given a soul. We were given a heart. We were given emotions. And our souls ought to be disturbed. Our hearts ought to be broken. And as for our emotions, I think, I think perhaps sadness and righteous anger would be what Jesus would feel when he hears about the things that are going on today. Right? And you may say, but isn't that what the world wants? Isn't that what the world is pushing for today? What the world wants is not God, because the world hates God, and the world hates us because we love God. They, they may not come right out and say it, but they do not want God to be any part of the conversation, of the solution, of the process of healing. God doesn't get to be a part of this. What the world wants what the world wants is to elicit a response, a response from our souls, from our hearts, from our emotions, without God in the picture, without God being part of the solution. What the world wants is to ignore the very root of sin that is causing all the problems in our society today. What the world wants is... That, look, when we take out that common denominator of sin in all of us, Right? This is why sin is so important to talk about. When we take out that common denominator of sin that makes us all equally in the position of needing grace and mercy, when we take that concept, that idea, that very reality of sin out of the picture, that sin which makes all of us equally fallen and broken and messed up, when we take that out, then... Okay, when we take the idea of sin out of the equation, then we can denounce racism and feel superior to those racists, to those others. Do you see what happens? 
what the world is vying for. The world wants to come and bring division. Do you remember the Pharisees' prayer? In, in, in Luke chapter 18, the Pharisee prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as his tax collector. And then to bring that prayer to modern day, perhaps the prayer that we feel justified to pray because we are not like them is, God, thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this racist. When we take sin out of the picture, now we have put ourselves on a moral high ground and we can look at the others and we can feel better about ourselves and feel superior and condemn and denounce others. What the world wants, what the world wants in the face of all that's going on is not a call to action to recognize our own faults and weaknesses but what the world wants instead is endless conversations where we can denounce and condemn those whose views do not agree with us, leading to not the solution, which is Jesus, but leading to these endless conversations. You know what they lead to? They lead only to division. Division, division. We've been talking about division. Division is deadly in the church. That's what the world is, is striving for, is to bring division between the us, not us as Christians, but us, we who feel morally superior, and those who are wrong. Not wanting us to recognize that even those, who, those of us who we, we think we're not racist, we are sinners. Given free reign, we would probably go down that road or we would find some other reason to see someone as being lesser than us. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we forget about honesty. If we allow the Lord's light to come and shine in our hearts to search the dark crevices, there's something in us that feels like we are better than someone else for whatever reason. And that is not right in God's eyes. That is not right in God's eyes. It just happens that today the flavor of the month is racism, but there's so many isms in us that need to be dealt with. And the only way to deal with it is to come back to the real solution, which is Jesus Christ who deals with our sins. Do you remember? Do you remember when Peter, when Peter was being a hypocrite? Not Peter Lay, but Peter the Apostle. When Peter was being a hypocrite, and remember, when, when the Jewish folks came from Jerusalem to visit, right, Peter would sit with the Gentiles and eat with them and break bread with them because he understood that God has, what God has called clean, no man should call unclean. So Peter was mingling with the Gentiles. But when the Jewish brothers came from Jerusalem, oh, they're, they're here. Uh, I, I can't be seen eating with these people. And so Peter would leave the table of the Gentiles and sit only with the Jewish people. And do you remember what happened? What Paul did, Paul did not call out Peter by shaming him and, and canceling him and, and pressuring him to comply. That was not what Paul did. Paul did call him out, but Paul called him out by, by reminding Peter of the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who died to save and justify us all equally, who believe in him, circumcised or not. Instead of bringing in division, which maybe is what the people in Corinth were, were referring to. Hey, you know, those of us that follow Paul, remember? You know, those of you that follow Peter, remember that time when Peter wouldn't sit with the Gentiles? You guys are following someone who's, who's got a kink, a kink on his shoulder. Division. Division, division is all we will ever have if we, if we go down the road that the world wants to lead us down, when we take Jesus out of the picture, when we take the issue of sin out of the picture. Look, I don't, I don't know, brothers and sisters, I don't know how engaged you are with the sin of racism that's, that's just been brought to the forefront of, our, of everyone's attention. I hope you are. I hope you are engaged with this issue. I hope and I pray that you do engage the issue. I pray that the Lord speaks to each and every one of us and convicts us of our own sin and our own folly. I pray that the Spirit of the Lord does His work in our midst. 
and I pray that we take great care, that we take great care to know the difference between what the world is calling us to and what the Lord is calling us to. We need to take great care to seek the Lord's wisdom to know the difference between what the world calls us to and what the Lord calls us to. Why? Because the wisdom of the world, as much good as the world seeks to do, the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Do you know that word futile? Do you know what that means? You'll try and you'll try and you'll try and nothing will come of it. The wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. But, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. One spirit with him. As our spirits are joined with the Lord, as the Lord deals with us, each and every one of us at our core, at our brokenness, only then from within, as we seek the Lord, as we pray, only then can all these issues that plague our world be rooted out and dealt with from the inside out, one person at a time. Otherwise, we all just become social warriors, social justice warriors, and, and, and we, we, we leave God out of the picture. And then one day we proclaim ourselves better by virtue of whatever it is that, that you claim your, your superiority. And then you've just fallen victim to another ism. The wisdom of the world is foolishness with God, but only as we follow the Lord only as we come and recognize that Jesus is the only solution. Only then can we do anything about the brokenness that is in this world. So I, I encourage you, I encourage you in these days, as we see all the brokenness around us, there, there's not going to be an end to it. The world is a mess. The world is is broken. The world being against God cannot ever come back to what it was meant to be on its own. And as we see all that's happening in the world, and I pray that things get better and things may get better for a season, but then something else will come up. As we walk in this world, we must understand, we must understand, seek the Lord, seek the Lord, seek the Lord. Seek his kingdom first. Come and ask the Lord Jesus, what must I do? What must I do? And let the Lord show you how to respond. Let's pray. Jesus, as, as, a, as the church, as your church, as your body, we have a responsibility, Lord, because we are your members we are your extensions. We are the skin that the world, that's been put on you that the world can see. We have a responsibility to act. But I pray, Jesus, for the church that we do not get lost in the hustle and end up joining ourselves to the world once again but that we, Lord, learn to seek you, to hear your voice, so that we can do what is right in your eyes, not what is right in everyone's own eyes, but that we can do what is right in your own eyes. And Lord, work on us first, Lord. Lord, come. Come this morning, I pray. Come and reveal to each one of us this morning where our sin is. Reveal to each one of us this morning where our isms are. And it may not be racism, Lord. It probably isn't. I, I know those of us in, in Porsche Light, and, and I would dare say, I don't think there's a racist bone in, in us, but I'm sure there's something else. Lord, you come and deal with us. Root out our sins and show us where we are not in your image. 
I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.